as an undergrad, I attended this seminar on a regular basis, and I'm honored uh, to be here as a speaker. That's very exciting. As Christina said, I was a symbolic systems undergrad. I focused on HCI, uh, so I feel like I'm coming back to my roots. Um, so one of the things that I do as a product discovery coach is I work with teams and I help them make better decisions about what they should build uh, by including their customer. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. Um, usually when I'm speaking to an industry, industry group, I share this map and I say, look, I've worked with teams all over. Odds are these tactics are going to work for you as well, because uh, in industry, we get a lot of skeptics that nothing will work anywhere. Um, I'm going to skip that part and just say that, look, um, uh, a lot of what you're going to hear today really is grounded in um, what I learned in the computer science department at Stanford and through the um, symbolic system, systems program at Stanford. And really what I've done for the last, uh, oh dear, 20 plus years <laughs> is really look at how do we make this as easy as possible for product teams to do this day in and day out. Because um, it's one thing to learn about kind of the ideal world and the um, way of doing things in the academic world. And then we get into business and it's messy and it's more complicated than that. So we're going to talk a little bit about what does this look like in practice. So uh, these days we use a little bit of different terms. Like as an undergrad, I learned about human-centered design and it was all about design thinking. Um, all of that obviously still exists in industry. Um, but in the product world, we're starting to talk about this as discovery versus delivery. And the reason for that name change is because it's really easy in um, industry to get obsessed with what did we ship, what are we producing, and all the work that we're doing to build, ship, and maintain a production quality product usually falls under this bucket of delivery. Whereas discovery is usually used to um, talk about the things we're doing to make good decisions about what to build. I'd say over the last 20 years, the industry is starting to recognize that if we want to make good decisions about what to build, we need to include our customer in that process. Now, if you're sitting here um, as a student focused on HCI, that sounds obvious. I will say I graduated into the world in the late 90s thinking, oh, business will just be human centered. And then I've spent the last 20 years being a little bit disappointed. That wasn't quite how it worked out. Um, but we are making major strides. And one of the big things that we're going to talk about today, if we look at the differences between, say, like the academic view of design thinking and what we're seeing with discovery in industry, it's really this simple. We're starting to recognize that we can't just include the customer in the process, that we also have to take a continuous mindset um, where we're looking at, look, digital products are never done. It's not like Netflix or Facebook or um, Spotify are going to show up to work one day and say, ah, our product's good enough, let's go home. There's always room for improvement. And so we're seeing this shift from a project mindset to a more continuous mindset. We're definitely going to talk about that today. And the other big difference we see between kind of this jump from design thinking to a dis this discovery language is this, I it's this idea that it's not just designers who do discovery, but everybody involved in um, building the product needs to be involved in this process. So if I have any computer scientists in the room that want to spend their day writing code, uh, this is just as applicable to you as it is the folks who want to do the design work. So let's dive in. We're going to talk about continuous discovery. And I, in my book, Continuous Discovery Habits, I defined it as um, weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product where they're conducting small research activities in pursuit of a desired product outcome. Now there's a mouthful here. Here's the idea. We have a team in a company that's responsible for building a product. Our goal is to get them to engage with customers on a weekly basis. When they're engaging with customers, they're doing a set of research activities that helps them get fast answers to that week's question. And the reason why we're doing this week over week is because our business needs us to drive a particular outcome and we're using our research to drive that outcome. Now we're gonna dive into this line by line because it's, there's a lot to unpack here. We're gonna start with why is it so important that we engage with our customers every week? And I'm gonna tell you again as an undergrad, I thought this was obvious because that's what I was taught uh, through the Stanford Computer Science Department and through uh, the wonderful, uh, the early beginnings of the D school. I was there before the D school. Um, and so this may sound a little bit obvious, but in, the, in, the, in business, this is not always obvious. So I'm going to share 
uh, a little bit about why this is so important. So when you're working on a digital product in a company, you're literally making product decisions every single day. Some of them are big strategic decisions, like which customer should we serve? Uh, what opportunity should we go after? Uh, others are more mundane decisions. They're just everyday decisions that are, that are also important. Like what do we label this button? Or what does the underlying data model need to support? How should this feature work? Most of us know that those big strategic decisions need some customer input, but we forget that those everyday decisions also need customer input. I'm gonna guess that everybody in the room and everybody on the Zoom uh, has a mobile phone nearby. So I wanna ask you to pick it up and I just want you to scroll through uh, your apps. And I'm gonna guess that every single one of you has at least half a dozen, if not a dozen or more apps that you were excited about at one point and they stopped working for you. Maybe they never worked for you over time. You installed it, you started using it and it was disappointing or it worked for you for a while and it didn't hold your interest over time. Maybe they updated it and it got worse for you. Uh, we have way too many examples of this. Why does this happen? My belief is it's because as product people, um, it's really easy to obsess about our products all day. We work on them from nine to five or many of us from eight to six or seven and all day long, right? And what happens is we start to suffer from this bias called the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge says that as we develop expertise in a topic, we forget what it's like to not have that expertise. You've probably experienced this. If you have a buddy who's studying like um, some archaic part of physics, I'm not picking on physics because I actually am enamored with physics, <laughs> but you don't understand it. They have a hard time explaining it to you because they forget what it's like not to have the knowledge you have. Well, it turns out as product people, we suffer from the same bias as well. We forget what it's like to not know where everything lives in our product. We forget what it's like to not know exactly what order to do things. And so we go about making these daily decisions and we're making them from our point of view. And they stop working for our customers because to us, it seems obvious, it seems easy, but in reality, we're moving further and further away from what's gonna work for our customers. Thankfully, there's a really simple way to overcome this bias. And that's simply, we just need to engage with our customers more often. We need to see the gap between how we think about the product and how our customers think about the product. Now, thankfully, most people in industry, and I'm guessing most people on this call, are really motivated to serve their customer. That's why we study human computer interaction. It's why we um, go out in industry and build digital products. So really it is this simple. If we can just engage with our customers more often and see that they think about things differently from us, we're gonna see that gap and we're already gonna be motivated to overcome that gap. So that's this idea of a continuous cadence and engaging with our customers week over week. It's really to help us remember who we're designing for, who we're building for, and make sure that the decisions that we make every day continue to work for them. Now the second line of the definition, by the team building the product. Uh, if you haven't been out in the industry yet, you may not be aware that a lot of companies try to outsource this research. They wanna hire a, des a design firm to do this for them, or they have like a business intelligence team that's going out and doing research and delivering it to the product teams. The challenge with this model is that it's hard for third parties, for centralized teams to keep up with the pace of individual product teams that are creating and shipping software week over week. When we're working on a weekly cadence, we actually need to be equipped to get our own fast answers because we need our research to support the cadence that we're working on. And it's really rare for a third party to be able to support that cadence. It's really rare for our centralized research teams to be able to support that cadence. So there's this idea of the team that's building the product needs to be engaging with customers directly. And this starts with this idea of a product trio. And this, it really is this idea of a cross-functional approach where we're taking product managers, designers, and software engineers and asking them to collaborate from the very beginning. Now I wanna contrast this with what we've historically done. Historically, a product manager wrote requirements, usually by working with business stakeholders. Once those requirements are written, they get handed off to a designer who does all the design work. And then both the requirements and the designs get engineers 
who are asked to build. What's wrong with this model? We see two major challenges. First of all, we see a lot of rework. The product manager tries to do the best they can to write requirements. The designer hits a snag. We got to rewrite requirements, redo, write, go back and forth between the product manager and the designer. We finally get something we can stamp off. We hand them off to engineers. They estimate it's going to take four times as long as we actually have. And what do we do? We go back, we rewrite requirements, we redo design. There's a lot of waste in this back and forth. The second thing we see, which is actually more important in my book, is that typically in a company, the customer is talking to a customer facing team, a sales team, an account management team, a support team, and that team is talking to the product manager and that product manager is communicating to designers and engineers what their requirements are. And what happens is it's like a game, a telephone. If you remember this game from like kid elementary school slumber parties, we all get kids in a row, somebody whispers a message, it goes down the line and the last kid says out loud what they heard and everybody giggles, why? because the message was distorted. This is what's happening in our companies. When we pass customer needs down the line, by the time we get to the people who are building the product, our engineers and our designers, the message is distorted and it's no surprise we're building the wrong solutions. So in a continuous discovery world, we're getting the team that's building the product to engage with customers directly so that they, we don't lose message fidelity, they get to hear firsthand from the customer what they're building, what they, should, what they need, and then they can combine their knowledge of what's possible with technology with their customer's knowledge of what they need, and they can build better products. Now, in industry, we have more than these three roles on our team, right? We typically have additional engineers. Depending on your DevOps strategy, you might still have QA folks or release managers. Depending on how you interface with the rest of the business, you might have data analysts, customer success folks, user researchers, product marketing managers. I actually could have put 100 titles on this slide. So scrum masters, program managers, project managers, there's a million of us. Here's the idea. Some people think only the trio participates in discovery, but that's not true. We want everybody on our team to have firsthand exposure to the customer. The idea of a trio is we want the trio leading discovery. This is our decision-making team. And the reason why it's a subset of our bigger team is because we're trying to make trade-offs between speed of decision-making and quality of decision-making. So the more people involved in a decision, the slower we're gonna go. However, the more relevant roles involved in a decision, the better decision we're gonna make. So the core idea of a product trio is how do we get the right cross-functional roles in the room for the type of decision that we're making. And historically, we let business stakeholders do this on their own. We let product managers do this on their own. And what we're recognizing with a product trio, we need to take a cross-functional approach so that we make better decisions, but we need to keep the decision-making team small so we're able to move fast and support our week-over-week -week development. Okay, so we've tackled this first half. We've got this We've got this trio that's leading our team. They're engaging with customers on a weekly basis. What are they doing when they engage with customers on a weekly basis? And this is where we really need to change our research methods. We need them to be smaller so they can be more cont continuous. And we need to make sure that they're in service of our desired product outcome. So we're gonna, these last two lines we're gonna tackle together. So I know as an undergrad, I was really hyper-focused on customer value. How do I serve my user? And this is really important. We see a lot of companies forget to be customer-centric, and we definitely want to bring this lens to our work. But it's not enough. We also have to create value for our business. And I know when I was 20 years old, I didn't fully appreciate this or understand this. I used to think, well, if I just create value for a customer, they're gonna pay money for something and it will create value for my business. Unfortunately, that's not always true. And if you're a currently a student, you may not be old enough to remember Google Reader, but it is one of the best examples we have of a product that customers loved, but it didn't create enough value for Google and they shut it down. We see lots of examples of this. A lot of early stage startups find things that customers want that they're not willing to pay for. And what happens when we find ourselves in this situation 
but we have a desirable product that's not viable, we actually don't get to serve our customer over time because our business doesn't survive. So I wanna encourage you to think about business value as a way to earn the right to serve your customer over time. If you're not also creating value for your business, your product will get shut down and you will not be able to create any value for your customer. So we're gonna talk about how do we align customer value and business value. And I want you to think about this as you're earning the right to serve your customer over time. So I created this visual, it's called an opportunity solution tree. This is how I help teams keep these needs aligned. It starts by defining an outcome. Now in industry, historically, we've had business stakeholders tell product teams, you need to build these specific features. That's an output focus. We're seeing a shift to business leaders recognizing, actually, we can't predict the future. We don't know what outputs right now we should be building, but we do know what impact we need them to have on our business. So we're telling our product teams, instead of prescribing features, we're telling them, this is the impact we need whatever you build to have, and we're measuring that with an outcome. I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna rely on Netflix for my examples. I'm gonna tell you I'm not affiliated with Netflix. As a coach, I've never worked with Netflix. I use Netflix because I speak globally and they have an amazing global presence. So everybody's broadly familiar with them. So Netflix is a, is a subscription business. What are some of the outcomes they're gonna care about? Acquiring more customers, keeping them engaged over time, increasing the length of their subscription, increasing how much money they spend every month. This is how we're gonna create value for Netflix. You could imagine that a product team at Netflix could be charged with, look, we're not sure what you should build, but we know whatever you build, it needs to increase subscriber retention. That's our business outcome. That's how we're gonna make sure we stay focused on creating value for the business. Now, business focus is not enough. We do wanna stay focused on the customer as well. And so we're gonna discover the opportunities that we think have the potential to drive our outcome. Now opportunities is a little bit of jargon. It stands for unmet customer needs, pain points and desires. So this is where we're looking at what's the customer value that if we created it would drive our business value. We're aligning these two things. So the opportunity space is infinite. I could spend the rest of my life trying to serve customer needs but I may not create value for my business. So we're gonna filter the opportunity space based on the opportunities that have the potential to drive our outcome. So in our Netflix example, I'm gonna look at what are the unmet needs, pain points, and desires that if I addressed them would have the potential to drive subscriber retention. And this is how I'm gonna align customer value and business value. Now in this model, outputs still matter. We do have to discover the solutions that have the potential to, to address those outcomes in a way that will create business value. That's really, it's in the solution space is where we're creating the value, right? We're giving customers solutions that address their needs in a way that supports our business. So what we're gonna look at are two small research activities that a product can team can do week over week. One's gonna help them discover opportunities so discovering those unmet needs, pain points, and desires. And the other is gonna help them discover the right solutions. Of course, all of this starts by setting a good outcome. Now I'm gonna tell you, especially if you're an undergrad in the room, when you graduate into the world, you might think, great, this is how the world works. I'm sorry to tell you most companies are not yet outcome focused. This is where we're moving towards. There's a lot of companies talking about how to do this. Some of them are kind of doing it. Few are very good at doing it. But the good news is we're seeing a lot of companies move in this direction. We are swimming upstream stream against about 100 years of business history where culture change is slow. Um, but we are starting to see executives at companies start to talk about outcomes and work with their teams and say, look, this is how you can create business value. And we're seeing this as a two-way negotiation where the leaders are saying, this is what we need from you. And the product teams are saying, this is how much impact we can have by when. That's the ideal view. We're getting closer and closer every day. Once that's in place, we're now looking at what's the first small research activity we're gonna do on a regular basis. And that's we're interviewing 
to discover opportunities. So we're interviewing our customers to uncover unmet needs, unmet pain points, and unmet desires. And because the opportunity space is always changing, we're interviewing week over week. We're continuously investing in what we know about our customer. Now, in industry, it's not so easy because companies like to put rules in place, like only these people are allowed to talk to customers or only I'm allowed to reach out to a customer as the salesperson and you as the product person are not allowed to talk to our customer. So one of the things I do with product teams right away to help them adopt a sustainable habit of talking to their customers week over week is we've got to overcome this hurdle of it's hard to find someone to talk to. And so what I recommend is that teams start by automating their recruiting process. Now this is gonna sound magical, but I want my teams to wake up on Monday morning and already have an interview on their schedule without them having to do anything. So it just appears. The most common way to do this is to set up workflows within your product where you're able to recruit people while they visit your product or service. So what you're seeing on the screen here is an example this comes from Snagit Job. They're hourly job boards, so they help restaurant workers and retail workers find work. They, own, they don't show this to everybody. They can just show it to a percentage of their population. You can see they're offering a $20 Amazon gift card for 20 minutes of their time. This is actually really valuable. In the United States, a lot of our states, people are making the federal minimum wage, which I think is something like $7.29 an hour. And Snag a Job is paying them $20 for 20 minutes of their time. This is an important thing to get right. You want to offer a big reward for a small ask. That's what gets people to click on that button and say, yes, I'll talk to you. Once they do that, they can pair this with scheduling software so that the interview automatically shows up on their calendar. This is by far the most common way I'm seeing teams automate their recruiting process. It's so that they don't even have to think about it. Interviewing a customer is just like going to any other meeting. Now for some product teams, recruiting their end users isn't the right strategy. They actually need to recruit those people's bosses. They need to recruit the decision makers, the buyers. And that's why we're gonna leverage our colleagues. Everybody working in a company has colleagues whose job it is to be on the phone all day, every day with customers. These are our sales teams, our account management teams, our support teams. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna define triggers for them. We're gonna say, when you're talking to a customer who's experiencing this need or pain point, go ahead and put an interview on my calendar. So these strategies might feel really foreign if you're currently a student and you haven't worked in industry, but I'm gonna tell you they're really critical for building this habit of how do we engage with our customers every week? Because what we're doing is we're making it easier to talk to a customer than to not talk to a customer. And that's our goal. Once we have a customer in the room or on a Zoom call, we now need to talk about how do we ask the right questions. Now, if you've interviewed a customer before, my guess is that you've come up with a big discussion guide. It's full of all these who, what, why, how questions. The challenge with this strategy is, it, is we tend to get speculative answers. And our goal in an interview is to avoid speculation. I'm gonna give you an example. If I were to ask Christina to, um, if I wanted to learn about Christina's Netflix behavior, mm. my intuition is to ask Christina questions like, what do you like to watch? Who do you watch with? What device are you watching on? How do you decide what to watch? And here's the thing, Christina's gonna have answers to every single one of these questions because that's how our brain works. Our brain is very good at generating fast answers. The problem is those answers aren't necessarily gonna reflect her behavior in reality. And it's not because Christina is trying to deceive me. In fact, I trust she's not. It's because we all experience cognitive biases, which most of the time are cognitive shortcuts that help us out. Sometimes they lead to faulty answers. And when we're talking about customer behavior, we tend to answer questions from our ideal selves. We be, tend to be optimistic about our behavior. We all think we're above average drivers than we are. We all think we're good listeners. We all think we work out more often than we do. We all think we let drink less alcohol than we do, right? We're just not very reliable when it comes to answering direct questions out of context. Thankfully, there's an easy way to fix this. We're gonna collect specific stories about past behavior. So I'm gonna ask Christina, 
tell me about the last time you watched Netflix. And I'm going to listen for where was she, who was she with, what device was she watching on, so I can still get my answers to those direct questions. But because I'm grounding them in a specific instance, I'm going to get far more reliable answers. There's another benefit to collecting specific stories. When Christina tells me a specific story, I get context. I get to imagine, I get to visualize where she is. I get the, the sequence of activities that occurred. And as I collect that story, I start to hear unmet needs, unmet pain points, and unmet desires. And this is what allows me to map out the opportunity space. And the value of collecting all these unmet needs, pain points, and desires and visualizing them is now I can make a strategic decision about how I want to serve my customer. For those of you that have had summer internships or have had work experience, you've probably experienced this problem in, in companies where the last customer you talk to dictates what you build. We overreact to the last conversation we had. If we instead collect all these need pain points and desires in one place, we can actually look at the set and say, actually, this one's more important than this one. And I see a lot of teams skip this step because we're too busy overreacting. Now we do wanna make a strategic decision. We wanna pick a target opportunity to start with. We're basically gonna say, this is how we're gonna create value for the customer. We're gonna solve this specific need or pain point. And then when we do that, what a lot of teams do is they jump to their first solution. They have an idea and they immediately start asking, is my idea good or not? And the problem with this framing is decision-making researchers call this a whether or not decision. This framing is gonna exacerbate a couple of known cognitive biases. The first is called the escalation of commitment. If you've read Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, he talks about this bias. The more we invest in something, the more we identify with it. The more we identify with it in the product world, we tend to fall in love with our ideas. When we fall in love with our ideas, we exacerbate a second cognitive bias called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias says, we're gonna notice all the evidence that says our idea is fantastic and we're gonna completely miss the evidence that suggests our idea is flawed. So even if we do the right things, we go to our customers, we try to get feedback, we test our idea. If we're working with one idea at a time, it's really hard to get good feedback. I'm seeing a question about the Ikea effect. Um, I have heard of the Ikea effect, but I can't recall off the top of my head exactly what it is. So if you want to just describe it really quickly, I can help connect the dots here for sure. Okay, so thankfully there's an easy way to fix this. And what we're going to do is we're going to set up a good compare and contrast decision. Instead of working with one idea at a time, we're going to work with a set of ideas and we're going to compare and contrast them against each other. When we compare and contrast, we trick our brain into seeing the pros and cons of each option. We already know this, right? This is why we um, talk to multiple companies when we're looking for a job, or we look at multiple apartments when we're looking for a place to live. We're comparing and contrasting. We sometimes forget to do this in the product world. Um, yeah, that, okay, yes, the IKEA effect of you enjoy things that you build. There's probably a little bit of um, escalation of commitment in there, right? You spend a lot of time building a piece of furniture, and now you love that piece of furniture. Um, that is a little bit of escalation of commitment in there. Escalation of commitment is really more about um, if I have to defend my idea, I'm gonna fall, I'm, I'm gonna like my idea even more, right? I'm gonna dig my heels in and get stubborn about it. So this idea of like if I'm gonna get feedback from you about my idea, I'm gonna to wanna to defend it, and then I'm gonna get stubborn about it. Whereas if instead we compare and contrast, now I don't have one horse in the race, I have multiple, and it's a lot easier for me to have some distance and be a little bit more objective. And this idea of comparing and contrasting is really powerful. I wanna give you a visual to help you remember. This is Usain Bolt. He's currently the world record holder in the 100 meter dash. If you saw Usain Bolt running around a track and I asked you, is he fast? 
I want you to hear a whether or not question. Is he fast or not? And I want you to ask relative to what? This is exactly what I want you to do when you catch yourself saying, is my idea good or not? Is it good relative to what? So let's play with this a little bit. Is Usain Bolt fast relative to a cheetah? Probably not. Is he fast relative to a Tesla? Wow, I would pay to see that race in the first 100 meters. I have no idea. Is he fast relative to other humans? Absolutely. What we're seeing in the photo on the right is a compare and contrast decision with a clear front runner, literal front runner. And there's another thing I wanna highlight about this photo. Every runner in this race is an elite runner. So we're not taking two bad ideas and comparing them to our favorite idea. We're taking three good ideas and we're comparing and contrasting until we have a clear front runner. This is a really important idea to keep in mind when you're evaluating solutions because a lot of teams go through all the right motions, they do the right things, but they don't get as much value from them because they're falling prey to the escalation of commitment and to confirmation bias. So we wanna set up good compare and contrast decisions. Now in industry, the reason why most of us don't do this is because we're stuck in this project-based research world where the way we test our ideas is we build them and we A-B test them to figure out if we built the right thing. That's insanity. We're doing all the work before we learned if it was the right thing. We even see this in the design world. We prototype the entire solution. We do all the design work up front before we know if it's right. There's a better way to do this that allows us to work with multiple solutions at once. I'm gonna to return to my Netflix example to illustrate this. I want you to imagine we interviewed a bunch of Netflix customers and we heard over and over again, I wanna watch live sports. So we generated three different ways to solve this need. The first is we're gonna partner with TV channels like NBC, ABC, TNT, whoever, ESPN, whoever shows your favorite sport. We're gonna partner with those channels and we're gonna integrate a live feed of that channel into Netflix. Second solution, we're gonna partner with different sports leagues. So we're gonna partner with Major League Baseball, the National Hockey League, MLS, and we're gonna license their games directly and push their games into the Netflix interface. Third solution, we're Netflix, we don't wanna get good at sports. We're gonna partner with Fubo TV, who's already done all this work, and we're just gonna bundle our solutions together. Okay, these are big solutions. We can't just build them and see what happens. The key to comparing and contrasting and testing multiple solutions is to take our ideas and to break them down into their underlying assumptions and to rapidly test those assumptions. Now, the reason why we don't do this is because we're often blind to our own assumptions. So first, we have to do the work to surface the assumptions our ideas depend upon. In the product world, we tend to make assumptions in five categories. Three of them are based on this Venn diagram that's become pretty common. I'm gonna start with these three and I'm gonna add two more. The first is desirability assumptions. Why do we think our customers want the solution? And why do we think they're willing to do what we need them to do to get value from it? The second is viability assumptions. Is this good for our business? <laughs> Remember, if we're not creating business value, we won't earn the right to serve our customer over time. The third is feasibility assumptions. Is it possible? Do we have the necessary skills and abilities? Can we create the required technology? The fourth we're getting pretty good at, and I will say this is the biggest change I see since the day I graduated to today in industry, and that's usability assumptions. We are seeing most teams care about, can people understand it? Can they find it? Are they able to do what they need to do? Don't get me wrong, we still have more to do here, but we are getting much stronger here. The fifth category, as an industry, I'm embarrassed to say we're terrible at, and I'm really hoping we start to get better at it, and that's ethical assumptions. <laughs> Is there any potential harm in building this solution? And this is where we wanna look at the ethics of the data we're collecting, who we're choosing to serve, who we're leaving out. Are we unintentionally replicating the inequities we see in our communities in the products that we build? And over the last two years, two or three years, we've seen a lot come out about this. That's pretty heartbreaking. 
Um, and I think we can be doing a better job. And one of the ways we can do this is to be deliberate about generating the ethical assumptions our ideas depend upon. Okay, knowing these five categories will help. You can ask, what are the desirability assumptions we're making? What are the ethical assumptions we're making? But you'll still have blind spots. So I'm gonna introduce a second strategy. We can story map our ideas and use our story maps to help us generate assumptions. Here's how a story map works. It's the yellow boxes on this slide. We're gonna fast forward into the future and we're gonna assume our solution already exists. And we're gonna map out what our customer has to do to get value from the solution. So we're gonna assume we've already integrated something like NBC into Netflix. Let's say we wanna watch the Olympics because the Net NBC airs the Olympics. What does a customer have to do to get value from this solution? First, they have to decide to watch the game. Then they have to choose a streaming service. If we work at Netflix, we want them to choose Netflix. Then they have to open that service. Then they have to find NBC. And then they have to watch whatever's on NBC. Here's the value of this very simple story map. I can now ask for each step, what needs to be true for my customer to take that action? So in order for my customer to decide to watch the Olympics, they have to wanna to watch sports. They have to be a sports fan. In order for them to choose Netflix, they have to know that Netflix has NBC. They have to wanna to watch sports on Netflix, meaning they don't already have Fubo TV and they're already satisfied with that solution. They have to be able to find our service at the time the game is on. Our service has to be available at the time the game is on. They have to know what channel the game is on. We have to be able to partner with that channel in an economically viable way. That, that event can't be subject to local broadcast regional blackout rights. If you've ever experienced that, that's pretty frustrating, right? Now when we get into viewing sports, we have to be able to create a good viewing experience. I'm gonna share, I'm a hockey fan, and most streaming services do not know how to stream a hockey game. Uh -huh. Here's why. Hockey games can end at any time in the playoffs. They go into infinite overtimes. What do most streaming services do? They put a bar at the bottom. If you're watching it on a replay, they tell you when it ends. It ruins the hockey game. It drives me nuts. <laughs> Terrible viewing experience for that type of content, right? So we have a whole set of assumptions around What's the right viewing experience given that we're now showing new content? What's the value of doing this? Each of these assumptions are easier and faster to test than the whole idea. The other value of this is each idea will depend on different assumptions. When we test assumptions from different ideas, that's what allows us to compare, to collect, compare, and contrast data. In one idea, my customer needs to know what channel the game is on. In another idea, they need to be able to just find the sporting event within Netflix. In a third idea, they have to install a whole separate app. As I test the assumptions about are they willing to do those things? Do they know what channel the game is on? Are they willing to add another app? Can they find the sporting event mixed in with all these movies and TV shows? As I test those assumptions, I start to get a sense for which of my solutions might be a clear front runner. Now there's several ways to test assumptions. I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail in the interest of time because I wanna make sure that we can get to Q&A. But I will share, we can rapidly test assumptions with prototypes. The key idea here is they're super focused on a teeny tiny assumption. They're not big prototypes. They're small prototypes designed to get us fast answers quickly. We can test assumptions with one question surveys. I can ask you, have you watched a sporting event in the past week and quickly learn if you're a sports fan? I can test assumptions by looking at the data I already have about you. I have behavioral analytics, I have support tickets, I have sales conversations. Are my customers already exhibiting the behavior I would expect to see? We're gonna blaze through this part on testing assumptions. I'll tell you where you can learn more at the end. For our feasibility assumptions, we can run research spikes. Research spikes are time-boxed activities where we ask our engineers to investigate something. To turn it into an assumption test, we need to give them a very specific task. For example, 
Maybe we have an assumption NBC can provide appropriate metadata about what's on TV right now. And we ask our engineers to collect 24 hours of data and to evaluate how often do we get appropriate data that we can just display in our interface. This is allowing us to, this is helping us evaluate how easy or difficult will it be to test this particular solution. By testing specific assumptions, we're collecting the data we need across our solutions to set up a good compare and contrast decision. Okay, we just covered a ton of ground. We started with this definition of a continuous discovery team. They're starting with an outcome. They're interviewing every week to discover unmet needs, pain points, and desires. That's the opportunity space. We're mapping out the opportunity space to get a big picture view of how we might reach our outcome. We're choosing a target opportunity. We're working with a set of solutions, comparing and contrasting them against each other by testing their underlying assumptions. That's what's allowing us to quickly evaluate which of these ideas might work. I know we covered a lot of ground really quickly. I will share everything we've covered. It's covered in depth in my book, Continuous Discovery Habits. I wrote this book to be a practical hands-on guide for product teams. If you're interested in learning what it might be like to work as a product manager or a designer, or even a software engineer on an outcome-driven team, I recommend checking out this book. All right, I think we're ready for questions. One. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, well, if anybody has questions in the Zoom, um, just go ahead and type it in and she'll answer it. Are there any questions here in person? Yes? Oh. I, I can repeat it. <laughs> okay. Um, what do you recommend, um, you know, when you say you have to engage the customers through um, surveys that you launch on your product, what if you're a company that's like still zero and you're still starting off lean? How do you manage that? So how can you get data from customers if you are a startup that has no customers? How can you run a survey on uh, no, no customers? Is that right? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so first of all, I will share, I have a blog post coming out on this very topic, uh, I think April 20th, but I'm going to give you the highlights. Uh, so if you don't have a product yet, you're an early stage startup, you're still pre-product or you have a product but you don't have customers yet, there's two ways to think about how to test your ideas. First, you need to go to where your customers are and second, you can pay to pull them to you. So let me give an example. Let's say that I wanna start a company helping podcasters um, build their audience. So first time podcasters, I'm gonna help them get to their first 500 listeners. How do I find podcasters as customers that I can help? First of all, there's a podcaster subreddit that I can go hang out in and meet podcasters. What I don't want you to do is just go to that subreddit and say, hey, will you be an interview participant? Because you're not gonna get any responses. People do that all the time and it's considered spam. Instead, hang out there, see what questions they're asking, help where you can, build relationships, and then use those relationships to then interview those people. That's one strategy, so go to where they hang out. The second strategy is we can build landing pages and use advertising to drive people to those landing pages. Now, if you have a teeny tiny budget, there's actually a lot of ways to get free ads. Most of the big app platforms will give you like 30 bucks or 100 bucks just to bring you in as a customer. So you can actually make quite a bit of progress even on a really small budget because you don't need hundreds of people. You just need a few first people to talk to and then once you find the first couple of people, end every conversation with who else should I talk to? Every podcaster knows another podcaster and that can get you your next conversation. Okay, we have a question from- Yes, so we have a question. From I'm kind of curious on ways that these kinds of discovery habits can be implemented in internships. Like, you know, Usually a lot of students, I guess, are our only form of work experience before we graduate our internships. And how do you think, you know, implementing those kinds of uh, discovery habits uh, would be good in the context of, say, uh, internships at either a startup or a large company like say, a Google or something like that? Yeah, here's what I tell you. Most of the places that you work are not going to work this way. That's the unfortunate reality. 
is that we're just starting as an industry to move in this direction. And there's a William, um, is it William Gibson? Yeah, William Gibson quote that I love, which is the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. So there are lots of teams that are working this way. They're just at a small percentage of the, comp of, of the companies out there. And so most people in our industry face this question of like, how can I as an individual adopt these habits if my organization doesn't work this way? I will tell you there's an entire chapter in the book about this very question, and I will give you the highlights. I, as a full-time employee at early stage startups, never worked anywhere where my executive said, oh, Teresa, you have a human-centered design background? Awesome, go do that here. They did not ever say that once. But because I had an HCI background, I stubbornly did it. I found a way to talk to my customers. I found a way to uncover unmet needs. I found a way to work this way regardless of how my organization worked. And you have a lot of ability to do that. Because first of all, you have an amazing network at Stanford. You know a ton of people. You have people in your network that are like your customer. So you have a way to get to people like your customer, regardless of who your customer is. You also have a way to influence in one-on-one -on -one conversations with other people in your organization. Make friends with a salesperson or a support person and get access to customers that way. So I really encourage everybody, regardless of your organizational context, to look for the smallest ways you can start to adopt these habits yourself, because I promise you, you will build much better versions of your, of your products, even if you're being told exactly what to build. Okay, we have another question from the audience. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, I I found one thing very interesting. You mentioned in the beginning that many startups find products that are actually valuable for the customer, and then they are just out of an economic perspective not viable. However, many of the greatest companies that are in the beginning weren't viable uh, out of a business perspective, and then over time found this viability. So, how do you kind of find this sweet spot where you say this is worth pursuing, although right now this might not be economically viable? How do you see that there is like a trajectory that this is a a valid business case. I'm not sure I don't I know how to answer this question without being controversial, so I'm just going to do it. Yay. Uh, so first of all, the vast majority of startups do not find the product that customers want. So that's the first problem. Desirability is probably the number one reason why customers fail, and it's because founders focus on their scratching their own itch and they don't bother seeing if anybody else has the same need. So that's the first thing. There are startups that do find um, desirable products, but they don't focus on the economics. That's what I had mentioned earlier in the topic, in the talk, and that's a big mistake. Now, the heart of your question was some companies go a long time without a business model and then they get and then they succeed. That only happens when you have venture-backed funding. That is the only way that can happen. Somebody has to fuel that growth. And the thing to know about venture-backed funding is that the only way you will succeed is if you are a home-run success. And that comes at a cost. The bigger, like the, the bigger success you go after, the higher chance of failure. And I'm not saying you shouldn't go after that because if you are willing to take those risks, that's fine. You just, and I know in Silicon Valley, we don't always talk about this openly, but if you're gonna take, if you're gonna take the path if I'm going to get big as fast as possible and I'll figure out the economics later, that means you have to get really big, you're going to spend a ton of money, and your chance of failure is going to be through the roof. Now, lots of some people do that and they have wild successes, and that's who we read about in the paper, but there's other paths to building products that people like, and there's other paths to building viable companies. And I think that's a big narrative that's missing, particularly in Stanford's area. 100%. Thank you, Teresa. We have another question here. I had a question about the research, research spikes that you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit more about, I guess, what that process looks like? And then do you get pushback from engineers who maybe think they don't have assumptions that need to be tested or like, why should they be doing this? You know what? I actually find that engineers are some of the best folks at identifying and testing assumptions. And it's because a lot of engineers are really analytical and a lot of generating assumptions is a little bit of this devil's advocate, just dis asking disconfirming questions kind of activity. 
And that's exactly the work that we do when we're coding. What are my edge cases? What could go wrong? Um, what are the situations that I haven't accounted for? And so those skills are actually really applicable to trying to take an idea and deconstruct it into its underlying assumptions. So I actually find most of the time, engineers are awesome partners on this. Um, now, it's really easy, especially for a young engineer, to think like, oh, it's gonna be really easy to build this solution. I don't have to test my assumptions. You know what, try it. Here's what I would recommend. Write down what you think is gonna be easy. Like I, one of the things I tell everybody, one of the most impactful things you can do, keep a decision journal. I'm deciding not to test this because I think it's gonna work out and it's obvious. Here's what I think is obvious. Now I'm gonna go do that thing and I'm gonna reflect on what actually happened. And I promise you there will be a gap 90% of the time. And that will help train you to see you are making faulty assumptions that do need to be tested. Thank you so much. Well, I see we've come up on uh, noon, so we're gonna go ahead and release you uh, to have your lunch as well. Uh, thank you so much, Teresa. Can we give her one last uh, round of applause? Yay, thank you so much for spending your time with us.